When I came in this evening, Brother Charles Robinson was kind of had a down look on his face, and he was saying, well, I did something to recently that, that kind of has made me sad. And he said, well, what was that? And he said, I gave away my religious library. He said, I can't read it anymore, and my eyes have gotten too bad. It's too hard to see. He gave it within his family, so it's not really entirely lost. But uh, you kind of have to understand uh, a preacher in his library and what that means. In, in my time now, it's really a little past my time, but anyway, in this time, let's say, so much is online, you can have access to so many different things. But even as a young preacher, for me, all that kind of stuff came and it came at a price. I mean, to have a religious book, to have a commentary, to have something that helped guide you in your preaching. You didn't do research on the internet. You didn't, find, you didn't have an internet to do it on. And there was limited resources. And, uh, and those books, early in life especially, were hard to come by. They were expensive and, and uh, you just really treasured them and you built up what you could to get you know, something to help you. And of course, Brother Charles did a good bit of preaching and studying in years gone by. And uh, I, I can totally sympathize with that, even though the age of, you know, having all of that in physical form has, has changed a good bit. For guys in earlier years, that was a, a real treasure. And I, I just bring all that up to, to say tonight and, and remind us of the fact that, that God's Word and the study of it and the examining of it is meant to have a serious and mighty impact on our lives. And to have these things are treasures to realize how significant they were, things that would help us understand what God has said, uh, that this is an amazing thing. It's something comparable to in ancient times that, and we were talking about this a little bit in our Bible class this morning, that you you didn't have what we have as far as a Bible today. To have a scroll was a big thing. And I know one of the last things that Paul wrote in 2 Timothy was telling Timothy to please bring the parchments, you know, so that he could study and examine, even though he wasn't certain that he would ever get out of that imprisonment. Please let me have something I can study and examine and study God's Word. I wonder how we are in our feelings about God's Word. And I realized this morning we kind of talked about that from the standpoint of being somebody that's teachable, but I want to approach the, the business of God's Word from a little different angle tonight, maybe something of a companion piece to that lesson this morning. I want to talk about trembling at God's Word. You know, I, I really what I had to say this morning had to do with attitudes and how we approach what God has spoken. But this is another one of those attitudes. And it just kind of fell this way rather than being deliberate on my part, but trembling at God's Word. And uh, in, in Psalm 114, verse 7, it says, Tremble, O earth, before the Lord, before the God of Jacob. I, I would dare say a lot of us don't take a trembling approach to our Christianity. We don't take a trembling approach to our religion, and we don't take a trembling approach to the study of God's Word, and yet we really should. And I, let me show you why that's true tonight. Look, look with me. I'm going to start over in Isaiah 66. I'm going to bring you into the New Testament for a moment after that, show you some related thoughts, and then we'll go back to Isaiah. Isaiah 66 verse 1, it says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What he's emphasizing is not the literalness of that, but the bigness of God. Imagine being so large, so encompassing, that big old earth to us is little more than the footstool that some of our ladies put their feet on during the worship services. To God, it's no more than that in size. Heaven itself becomes the throne of God. And, and it was said in that day, how could you build me a house? We all know that there was a temple and before that a tabernacle. But the serious question is, how then could you build a home for me, a place where I could inhabit? Where could a place be found that I could rest in? That's an interesting question. Now that doesn't have much to do with trembling, 
but it does have a lot to do with the gigantic nature, the big nature of Almighty God, and what we think about that. I'm going to take you to the New Testament where that passage is quoted, and it's in the sermon that Stephen was preaching in Acts chapter 6. It says they were persecuting Stephen, and they said this man, this is what they said about him, that he never ceases to speak words against this holy place. They're talking about the temple, of course and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. They're probably right about that. If I understand Stephen's preaching, he was talking about the replacing of the old covenant with the new covenant that would enable and enact some changes, like from the Sabbath day to the Lord's day. Uh, The animal sacrifices would be done away with And Jesus, by the way, had said that he would come and destroy that place. And you need to read in in the book of Matthew and around chapter 24 and some earlier chapters as well about that. But what they're charged is true, and yet they're misunderstanding. And one of the things that hits me about this, they seem to be a whole lot more concerned with the temple, which had its place, but they seem more concerned about that than they seemed about God's Word. Oh, he's talking against this place. And they were very proud. Even Jesus' disciples seemed very proud of the temple and its magnificence and all of that. But the question was, what about the Word of God? How did they feel about that? And in Stephen's speech in Acts 7, his lesson there, he just makes the point that it was Solomon who built this house originally, this temple. Solomon built a house for him, for God, and yet, and here's something important that he brings out, that Stephen brings out about the truth. He said, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with men's hands. And this is where he quotes what we read a minute ago. He said, the prophet said, heaven is my throne. Okay, going back to Isaiah now. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of a house would you build for me, says the Lord? What is the place of my rest? The point is that God is saying, Look, I made everything. You make this little house over here. Do you honestly think that's a place that I could come live in? Do you think it could in, in, that I could inhabit this house? Okay, we'd all say, well, in one sense, didn't God say he did that? That God says, you know, I will come and meet with you there. And that's true. And it was the Lord's house. Even Jesus called it his Father's house. But the simple truth is we misunderstand God if we think that housed God somewhere or another. For it never did, and nor could it. And it was God's hand that made the heavens and the earth. How could you build them a house, is Stephen's point. And he showed these scriptures to prove his point. Then then Stephen says, you know, here's the problem. He says, you, God's people, supposed to be, you are stiff-necked. You're uncircumcised in your heart. Stiff-necked is exactly the opposite of that teachability we were hitting at this morning. You are stiff-necked people, and you're uncircumcised in your heart and your ears, and you always resisted the Holy Spirit. Always in your history. He's talking about historically. You have resisted the Holy Spirit. Your fathers did it, and you do it. So when they heard these things, well, they were enraged, and as an act of defiance, it says they ground their teeth at him. Now you've got to think about this for a moment. It all revolves around that Old Testament passage of what God said, how big I am, how large I am, what a great God I am. And the discussion is all about the temple of God and all of that, which isn't my main concern tonight. But they're upset because he's preaching God's word. The things he says, the teaching that he gives them, enrages them. Now let's go back to that passage and remember what he said. Where's this house you could build for me? Where's a place that I might rest? The question is, where would I go? God, I mean, in other words, this is God saying, you're concerned about the temple, and there's some reason to be, but then there's another reason where they're all caught up in that concept, 
And God says to them this interesting passage. He said, you want to know where I am. You want to know where I would be. Like over there at that temple, well, God says this. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. Now what is God saying there? God is saying, look, your concern is about that house over there. And it was built for me and all of that's true, but I want to tell you where I'll be. I want to tell you who I'll dwell with. I will dwell with somebody that's humble, one of our points this morning. I will dwell with somebody that is contrite, who lowers themselves in contrition in their spirit towards me. And I will dwell with the person that when they hear my word, they tremble. They tremble at the thought of what I have to say. As a people in our time, having been taught that about the only thing you need to know about God is that He loves you, that's a foreign concept. I dare say a lot of Christians, in truth, don't really tremble at the Word. And I'm going to tell you tonight why you should. I'm going to talk to you about why that's so important and and what the significance of. Even at verse 5 he repeats, Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at His word. You think. You think about what God is speaking to us. You know, great men of God, number one, they trembled when God spoke. They realized this significance. Let's look at a few cases. Moses, when he was at the burning bush, Acts 7 records this about him, verse 31, 32, the voice of the Lord came to him and said, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And it says, and Moses trembled and dared not look. He's at the burning bush. He'd been curious about it before that, but now he stands in awe of it. Moses shakes in his flesh at the very thought that it is God speaking. He is the God of his great fathers. Moses later at Mount Sinai, what do we read? As he stands there on the mighty quaking mountain, the book of Hebrews tells the story from the New Testament standpoint. And it says that when God's word came at Mount Sinai, that the scene was so terrifying. It was so amazing. It was such an upheaval of nature that Moses said, I, and I think the point is, even I, am scared. Even I am trembling with fear over what's happening this day. It was just overwhelming for Moses. I mean, this is Moses who saw God part the Red Sea. This is Moses who went up against Pharaoh. This is Moses who's already seen many wonders of God. But at this site at Mount Sinai, Moses himself was somewhat unnerved by what was going on on that occasion. And yet he knew he was in the presence of God and he knew what this meant to the children of Israel. And then David in the book of Psalms writes this in Psalm 119 verse 120. My flesh trembles. I stand in awe of your laws. The laws, the truth revealed by God causes David to tremble at the thought and significance of of what's being written there, of what it says to him, and what it means for his life. Daniel. Daniel was approached by an angel. He was told the word of God, what God meant in the Daniel chapter 10. And it says of Daniel that while he was speaking this word to me, in the first person, Daniel writes, while he spoke to me, he says, I, I stood trembling. You know, sometimes Daniel writes, I, I can understand, I mean, I'm not in the same situation, but Daniel would write and he would say, I just, you know, it's just like I about passed out after all this happened. This overwhelmed me because divine presence was in my midst. I was hearing what God's word was. It meant that to him. Jeremiah, Jeremiah is told to go preach judgment to the people. How does Jeremiah feel about this? Jeremiah 23, verse 9, he says, well, here's how I feel. My bones tremble. I feel, almost a comical way to put it, but there's nothing funny about it. 
he said, I feel like I'm intoxicated. I feel like my body is out of control. I feel weakened, like my knees shake, like a man overcome with wine. But I'm not drunken, nor am I out of my head. I feel that way because God has given His Word to me, and and it just simply takes my body and consumes me and and makes me feel weak and, and like I'm overcome by something. I think about Paul's talking about the work that he did and how he'd go places. He talks about to the Corinthians. When he went and preached the gospel, he says, I was we I was with you, but when I was with you, I was in weakness and I was in much fear and trembling as I did the work of God. Can you imagine? That God commissioned Paul, Jesus on the road to Damascus commissions Paul to go forth and preach the gospel. A Jew, a Jew that's done nothing but the law, to go out there amidst a pagan world, an idolatrous, ungodly world, and go amongst those people and proclaim Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul said, I got the jitters. I felt trembling, fear and trembling, when I did the work of an apostle. Of course you did, Paul. How could you feel any other way? But I want to go now to the exact reasons why there should be fear and trembling in our hearts. While loving it, trusting it, appreciating it, seeing its value, there should be to all of us fear and trembling about what we hold in our hands. So common that we probably all got a book of the Bible, I mean a a Bible is what I'm trying to say, at childhood, and yet why should there be fear and trembling in our hearts? Well, there should be fear and trembling because in studying the Word of God and worshiping God and in giving our hearts to this thing, there's something we often don't catch, and that is we're standing in the presence of God. God is an omniscient God, just what he was saying to in Isaiah and what was Stephen was talking about, and said, you, you can't say God's just over here in this spot or over there. Even to say God's up there in heaven, but that's true, but in another sense, God could be right here with us seeing everything, and I believe is. And, and that we're in the presence of God, and that we need to catch hold of that concept. The very thought in Psalm 99 verse 1 that the Lord is in charge, the Lord reigns. And that the correct response from people like us is, let's tremble. I don't mean, let's do it artificially. I mean, let us tremble. Let's get our minds saturated with the thought, what does that mean? Psalm 114, verse 7, Tremble, O earth! at the presence of the Lord, that the presence of the God of Jacob, it's time to tremble. It's an appropriate response to the things of God as we've studied that many a godly man had in his life. God is greatly to be feared. Now this is an assembly statement. Psalm 89 verse 7. Start over. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. I know we think about a lot of things and have a lot to think about when we assemble. Do you think about that? That God should be feared in our hearts in the assembly of the saints. And that He is to be had in reverence about all those that are about Him. We gather together in His name. We're all about Him here. We're all about Jesus. We're gathering in His name for His purposes Let there enter into our hearts fear and trembling, respecting what this is all about that we've come to do. The power of creation ought to just simply get in our hearts. I mean, I I, I don't know what order these points should have been in. Maybe that one should have been first. But think about what you feel when you feel the awesomeness of God's creation. When you see things that God can do out there in the natural world, things that we are treated to and yet awed by. This is brought up in great detail in the book of Job as part of, uh, of both the lab and, and God's proof that, that God is in control. But here's some selected thoughts from these passages. He covers his hand 
with the lightning. He commands it to strike the mark. I, I'll tell you what, I, I understand, I'm not a fool, uh, I understand that there are such things as natural forces. I get this, but don't forget, they're God's natural forces. And so the lightning strikes over here and you say, yeah, well that happens because these, uh, these elements move about and it builds up static and all of this. That all may be true and I'm not debating that. What I'm saying is God is commanding and it's striking the mark. Think about that a while. I mean, I think we need to all understand that yes, there's natural forces, but God's the God of the natural forces. Don't remove him from this story because that's the whole point of understanding. So when the lightning hits out there in, in nature, that's just a real good time because it really gets your attention usually. It's a good time to realize God is striking the mark at that moment. That roaring of the thunder declares that God is at work. It declares the presence of Almighty God. The cattle out there, you pass a field and there's a bunch of cows out there <clears throat> they also concerning what is coming up. In other words, they realize something is happening. At this also, he says, my heart trembles. It, it leaps from its place. Listen closely to that thunder, to that thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes forth from his mouth. I, I just bet you most of us when we hear that just think, oh, might be a storm coming up, fine. Hear that God is speaking something to you. God has something to say that day, and what he has to say is, I'm in charge of all of this. I do all of these things. Again, under the whole heaven, he lets it loose. His lightnings to the ends of the earth, and at once a voice roars. He thunders with his majestic voice. He does not restrain the lightnings when his voice is heard. God thunders with his voice wondrously, doing great things which we cannot comprehend. Let those, let those words get in your heart. Is there a lesson in the storm? The lesson is, God is saying, I do great things. And that, to, to be honest with you, when the, when the lightning hits really hard nearby, and that thunder roars, and you just feel the windows of your house shaking, doesn't it kind of grab hold of you? Can you not envision in your mind God's thunderous voice? God is speaking of His power. He's showing you His power. And He is telling you things that are beyond your comprehension. Back to the Exodus story. That they're getting ready at Mount Sinai and things are happening. Read a little bit of this with me here from chapter 19 and 20. It came about on the third day. When it was morning, there was thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain. Very loud trumpet sounds so that all the people in the whole camp, they were all trembling. They all started to shake in their boots thinking about what's going on here and, and what's happening on that mountain. All the people, verse 18, 19 of chapter 20, all of them perceived this thunder, this lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, the mountain was smoking. When the people saw it, they trembled and they stood at a distance. They were in awe of what they saw. They, they said to Moses, now this has always been interesting to me, they tell Moses, you, you speak to us yourself. We will listen to you, Moses, but don't let God talk to us, or we might die, we will die. Moses said to the people, you don't need to be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, in order that the fear of Him might remain with you, so that you may not sin. Why was all of that necessary on the mountain? He said, so that you will keep fearing your God. you got to stop and think. Well, so many of those people failed, but you got to stop the rest of their days. Would you ever remember anything but that day where a mountain was on fire and smoked and shook and, and the voice of God spoke? And they trembled. And God said, that's okay for you to tremble. It's okay for you to be afraid. I want you to remember me, and the more you remember me, maybe it'll help you not sin. Maybe it'll shake you up a little bit and make you think 
before you do something wrong. You might ask, well, why would that be? Well, let me ask you this. If you were at Mount Sinai and saw all of that and, and felt that ground shaking and the, saw those thunderbolts crashing above the mountain and the mountain smoking, if you saw all of that, let me ask you this. What if you knew one day you'd meet that same God again at judgment? What if one day you knew, I have to face that God? Would that make you think differently about how you live your life and your priorities and what you put in first place in your life? I think it would. I think it should at least. The power of God. Okay, another reason we might tremble. We tremble because we develop that fear of God in our hearts. And I believe it's a reverential fear, not a running away fear. But dominant in the word is fear. Fear and trembling. You're trembling because you're afraid. And in fact, the New Testament uses that combination, fear and trembling, several times. And uh, I believe that trembling there is the, kind of the same concept, almost a trauma a little bit, trumos from where we'd get that word. Trembling is uh, shuddering and, and, and being afraid, having the terror get in your heart and, and making you shake because you would think about this. Jeremiah 5.22 says, Do you not fear me, God asks. Do you not tremble in my presence? I, I think we would probably ask it, should you not do that? If you're really thinking about who God is, what He is, and what this is all about. Psalm 2, verse 11, serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. It doesn't take our joy away. It doesn't take our happiness away. But what it does do is focus on the awesomeness of what this is all about, the significance of all of this, because the fear of God is in our hearts. And... I think that it makes sense to understand that sometimes as we tremble at God's word, it is because it's just simply pointed out what's wrong with me. It is, it is said I'm guilty of this sin or that sin. It's exposed to me. It's shown me up. And, and you realize you stand. I was talking in class we were this morning in our Old Testament class about Josiah. Josiah had a, a unique, unique kingship in uh, Judah, and uh, he was awesome king. So there wasn't anybody like him before, and wasn't anybody like him after. But he tried to do the best he could to turn people around back to God. And then one day, God did something really important for him, and that is, God let him find a scroll. And the scroll showed him God's law. Evidently, so much of this was lost to them. And the priest that found the scroll came to Josiah and read it to him. You know what Josiah reacted? Do you think he applauded? Do you think he was happy? Do you think he was all smiles? Now I've got God's law. It said he was sorrowful. You know why he's sorrowful? Because he realized they weren't doing what was right. Even though Josiah worked hard to make reforms, he realized we aren't yet what we need to be. And the Word of God uncovered that for him and made it clear in Psalm 119, verse 120. And you remember Psalm 119 is all about God's Word. Long, long text of the Bible. Longest, book of the Bi longest chapter of the Bible. And it says, My flesh trembles for fear of you. I am afraid of your judgments. I'm afraid of what it means. And I was in Ezra, chapter 9 at verse 4, it says, uh, Everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel on account of the unfaithfulness of the exiles, that's when they came back. Ezra's up there teaching God's word, explaining them to them about what they should be doing. Part of it was they had intermarried with pagan population and they were already starting to get corrupted by that again. Ezra says himself, I was pretty appalled at all of this. But the reaction of the people was, it says they trembled. They realized something's not right here. It's struck deep in their hearts. You may think, well, that's terrible. We don't want to make people feel uncomfortable. You know, I remember the night I was baptized. It was the most uncomfortable service I've ever been through. I was trembling on the inside. Because I 
was dwelling heavy and hard. Matter of fact, I just remember it was hard to listen to the lesson. But I was trembling on the inside that I need to do something. I can't just keep living like I've lived. I can't keep ignoring God. Something needs to happen here. I tremble. Then these people trembled as they thought about what it was that God was saying to them. But it's that trembling that makes us stop and think and try to correct ourselves. It's getting serious about God's Word in this way. And so here's the response at chapter 10, verse 3. It says, so now the people said, let's make a covenant with our God and let's put away these wives. And naturally, normally, we'd think, well, the putting away of a wife and children is not a good thing. But what they had done is they had disobeyed God and married people that should never have married to start with that would lead to the same corruption that had corrupted them before. And they're thinking about the counsel of God. God had been so clear about this in His Word. And those who tremble at the command of God wanted to do something about that. They were ready to do something about it, even though it meant disorder and disruption in their lives. Proverbs 16, verse 6 answers to that and says, well, when that kind of fear gets in you, it causes you to want to get away from evil. But I think this casual feel with God sometimes makes us get comfortable with sin. But you get that right kind of fear of God in your heart, it helps us get away from it. We're scared of it. It frightens us, the very thought of it. I, I think we should tremble because God's... God's done something unique with us, and that is He gave us enormous responsibility about the development of our salvation. If you look, Paul speaks of this in Philippians chapter 2 at verse 12, and he says, Therefore, my beloved, <clears throat> you've always obeyed, you've been good, good Christians and all this, but he said, I'm not there. I'm not present with you anymore. And... Uh, he said, you did it when I was with you, but now I'm absent. So, during this time, you're responsible for your salvation. Work out your own salvation. You have responsibilities of this. Doesn't mean nobody else in the world did uh, have any responsibilities here. But it's just making the point. Uh, and it's a great point. You know, here's just the simple fact. If you go to heaven, it's going to be because you were serious enough to go to heaven. If, you, if you're lost, it's going to be because you failed to be serious enough about it. And so Paul says, you work out your own salvation. That doesn't mean just do it any way you want to. That means you have responsibility for you. I'll tell you what, I, I'm not... I understand the point. We all ought to do for everybody. We ought to help each other. We ought to encourage each other. And when we come together and worship, I usually see a good bit of that going on. But here's the point, bottom line. Sometimes we act like, well, I've grown weak and nobody's doing anything for me. Work out your salvation, my friend. Get your act together and work out your salvation. Get with it. God didn't say everybody in the world is responsible. It's just kind of like people out here who don't envision a life without somebody giving them money and somebody helping them, and they can't think of eating without getting it from somebody. At some point, when are you going to take responsibility? When are you going to go down and get a job? I saw a woman today begging on the side of the road. In the time she begged, she could have been applying at the, you know, at the store and getting a job. I can't imagine that she didn't look like she was infl you know, afflicted in any way. Or hurt. Get out there and do something. But in regard to our salvation, work it out. Get with it. Worship the Lord. Pray to the Lord. Study your Bible. Do these things. Quit acting like it's everybody's responsibility to get faith into you, to get repentance into you, to get all of this. Get with the program with fear and trembling. Maybe that's the missing element here. Maybe that's what we need. Maybe we've been so casual towards God that it doesn't, doesn't kick us in the stomach very hard. Let it. Let it kick you a little bit. Let some fear and trembling enter into our hearts and souls and, and make some progress here. Look, look at these statements. I'm not going to explain them. They say what they say. 
This is serious business. If you're going to get in, you know, into the kingdom, you're going to strive to get in. If you're going to make it to heaven, it's going to be because as you were running, you said, I've got to lay this weight of sin down and get rid of it. I'm not going to be able to run this race with all this weight tying me down. If you're going to make it, you're going to have run because you endured in your running and you didn't give up. If you're going to defeat the devil, it's going to be because you looked the devil in the face and said, my Lord matters more to me than you, and I'm a whole lot more afraid of him than I am of you. Even Jesus talked about that. He said, you, you, you better worry about the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. You better worry more about me than about these earthly things. Resist the devil. Peter says, you, you better give all diligence if you want to make it. That, that's what salvation is like. Jesus said, you want to make it? You endure all the way to the end. So it's always compared to a race. We've got to finish the race, don't we? Don't talk to us about, well, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to make it or not. Well, you're going to make it because you stayed with it. If you quit, you're not going to make it, I can guarantee you. If you get lazy, you're not going to make it. But if you'll endure all the way to the end, that's going to be great. But how does we get motivated about that? Because fear and trembling invades our hearts. It kind of brings us to the, the biggest part, I guess, about all of that is thinking about the judgment day. In the book of Habakkuk, he's not talking about the literal final judgment day. He's talking about the destruction of Judah. But he says this, I heard... I heard and my inward parts began to tremble. I trembled on the inside. The sound, at the sound of it all, my lips quivered. De decay entered my bones. I, in my place, I trembled because I have to wait quietly for this day of distress. He was talking about the invasion of the Babylonians. The people who arise are going to invade us. He said, I know, I know it because God said it's going to happen. The, the book of Habakkuk is all about Habakkuk trying to figure out how can this be right that God will let this happen. But bottom line is, he said, I know it's going to happen whether I want it to happen or not because it's coming and God said it's coming and that's all there is to it. So I just better get ready for it. But he said, it still scares me to death. In the book of Revelation, a similar thought is mentioned, and that is in Revelation 6, verse 12 through 17. I looked when he opened the sixth seal. Behold, there was this great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became like blood. The stars of heaven were falling to the earth. Like a fig tree would drop its figs late when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky began to recede back as a scroll when it's rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And so all of a sudden, all these movers and shakers, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, but not just them, every slave and free man, everybody, he's saying, but all the people we would have thought had their defense up, he said, all of them hid in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's a powerful scripture. Just imagine the thought, the day that the heavens recede, the sky rolls back like a scroll, the stars are falling, everything is coming undone, and we know it, and there's no place to run, and there's no place to hide, but all we can think of is if there is just a place where the rocks could fall on top of me and hide me from the wrath of God and on the throne and the Lamb of God, if I could just somehow or another escape that. Now let some of that get in your heart, and you'll have fear and trembling. That's the true story of the judgment day. That's a picture of... It foreshadows what the judgment day would mean to you and me in Revelation. Uh, well, did you catch that last line? He said that this is the day of the wrath has come. And what's putting the fear and trembling in all of us is, he said, who's going to be able to stand? How are you going to do in that day? Will you be ready for the judgment day? Psalm 2, verses 1 through 12. This is interesting. It's predictive of the coming of the Lord. 
the coming of Jesus. I'm talking about not the, not the final coming, but His first coming. When He would come and, and live His life and work His wondrous works and be the Son of God, but at the same time be the King. And it, you need to read it all, but this is where it comes down to. All of that's not here up here, but it says, take warning. And, and you kind of got a picture of this trial of Jesus and uh, him going before judge after judge after judge. He's with the Jewish judges and then he goes to Pilate and he goes over to Herod and then he comes back to Pilate. There's all this discussion back and forth. What should you do with Jesus and all of that? And, and this predictive psalm looked at all of that and he said, you know, you need to take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence. Rejoice but rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son. That really meant bow down to His feet. You need to bow down to the Son of God so that He will not become angry and you perish in the way. For His wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed is everybody that's taking their refuge in Him. He said, He's my safe place. He's where I want to be. I want to be in Christ. I want to be with Him. I want to be on His side. I want to stand with Jesus Christ so that in that day, He will not be angry at me. You know, all the arrogant men of the world and women of the world today who speak their blasphemy and their vileness, I just wonder what it's going to be like for them in the, that day. You, you, do you understand that he's right there saying, all you who are in authority now, you better realize that you're under authority to him. He's over you. Don't kindle his wrath. Don't kindle his wrath. James chapter 2 says something interesting and we're at our end. It says, even the demons now these are the fallen forces of the devil as far as we know and understand even the demons tremble Amen. think about that even these that have led rebellions and a heavenly host against God they tremble before God they believe and they tremble. So I got a question for you this evening. That's our final question. That is this. What does that say if we don't tremble? If a demon trembles at the thought of what God would do, what does it say about a human being that doesn't tremble? I don't think it says very good, does it? We need to take God very, very seriously, don't we? We're going to stand and sing an invitation song, and as we're singing it, you're welcome to step forward and render your obedience with fear and trembling tonight. And come and be baptized, come and be restored, whatever your need is, we'll help you along that way. Let's be standing and sing together. Things are ready. Come to the feet.